Um, this session is called U.S. at War. My name is Susanna Freed, and I'm moderating this session. We will just to start by saying that the first speaker who was listed, Steve Greer, unfortunately wasn't able to come, but the other four speakers will uh, are all here, and we'll actually have them speak in the order that they're listed. Um, and I wanted to introduce the session by saying that it's a pleasure to be here and I'm, it's really, um, it's a timely conversation and, and great generally that, that it's happening and that this particular conversation is happening. And interestingly, based on the abstracts, what I would say is that the, the presentations are a little less about the U.S. at war itself and more about the context and ideology of U.S. militarism and what that means seen through a lens of gender and feminist theory in some cases, looking at hetero and homo normativities and the ideologies that those set into motion looking at queer theory, post-colonialism, and, and in a sense really taking up the ideology of militarism and what that, what that means, how that plays itself out, um, looking through a lender of gender, queer theory, sexuality. So, um, and I see everybody nodding, so I, I, that I think that means that they agree that it, it is really about militarism and the ideology of militarism. So, with that, I'm going to turn this over to the first speaker. The first speaker is Ryan Ashley Caldwell, and Ryan is a professor of sociology and women's studies at Soka University in California. Well, thank you so much for coming to the session today. Uh, the title of my paper is Force Feminization, uh, Heteronormativity and Gender Abuse, Torture at Abu Ghraib, at the Zimbardo Prison Study, and Beyond. Media depictions, popular perception, and academic explanations for the infamous torture at Abu Ghraib at the hands of American soldiers have utilized con conceptions of chaos as a means to describe and explain the abuse. For this reason, many read and understand the abuse and torture of prisoners at Abu Ghraib as being about the actions of a handful of rogue soldiers, named the Rotten Apples, operating in an environment of chaos. The government's own theory of the abuse is that there were originally seven rogue soldiers with moral failures who just went out on their own and engaged in this conduct. At the trials themselves, of which I was a consultant for the defense, for Lindy England and for Sabrina Harmon, it became clear that there were leadership, training, discipline, chain of command, resource, environmental, and sociocultural issues that need to be considered in order to get a full picture of the context of Abu Ghraib and how some abuse was inevitable given these conditions. Instead of pinning the abuse on lower level soldiers, arguing that they acted alone and with no direction, I offer an additional reading of this abuse in terms of gender and power to describe what caused these events. The code of cultural masculinity, where both masculinity and heterosexuality function together as powerful cultural ideologies, was demonstrated at both locations I will discuss today namely at Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment and also at Abu Ghraib. At both locations, sexualized and homoerotic torture and forced feminization existed as torture techniques where exploited notions of masculinity and fears of homosexuality existed. Zimbardo's paradigm, which is subsequently used to understand Abu Ghraib, and in fact, he uh, was an expert witness at um, one of the trials at Abu Ghraib, the very first one, um, cannot explain these phenomena sufficiently, where gender and sexuality are themselves <coughs> used against prisoners and as torture techniques. So if you don't know about Abu Ghraib, I'll give you a little um, description here. And as well, uh, the photos of abuse are at um, salon.com. Um, so Abu Ghraib uh, prison, it was known as Saddam Hussein's infamous torture chamber. It was the site of weekly executions under his regime where political dissidents were tortured. And American, um, when the American occupation forces uh, invaded Iraq in 2003 and overthrew the Iraqi regime, the American military took over the prison itself and continued running it, 
although uh, this was not a common tactic in the middle of an active war zone and was using it as a detention facility. The iconic photographs of abuse in 2003 at Abu Ghraib prison are explained by social scientist Philip Zimbardo, and even most recently in his TED talk, through a narrative and analysis of group conformity and in terms of his 1971 Stanford prison study. Zimbardo's experiment provides an explanation of group conformity to social roles, which he argues within a social context can influence, shape, alter, and even transform human behavior. The Stanford prison study simulated a mock jail situation where exclusively male students were randomly assigned the role of guard or prisoner. This experiment was aimed at understanding the behavior and psychological consequences of occupying and maintaining the role of a prison guard or prisoner within an institutional environment. So basically, a, realistically, a realistic looking prison block was constructed in the basement of Stanford University and 24 uh, physically and psychologically healthy men were selected for experiment. So try and get that past IRB. Um, they were, I, get, I do this all the time in my school, no. Um, <laughs> my students love this stuff. Right? They were given their roles at either as either guards or prisoners and spent the next two weeks in the prison with each other. Uh, Zimbardo was, uh, the, he was the superintendent of the prison, uh, so he had a role. And he instructed the guards not to physically harm the prisoners, but to create situations of boredom, frustration, fear, and arbitrariness so that the prisoners understood that the guards now controlled their lives. So again, in this way, uh, Zimbardo played the role of warden in his own experiment. Um, it was the guards' responsibility uh, to maintain constant surveillance of the prisoners. They had no degree of privacy, and this is how they understood, the prisoners understood their absolute helplessness. Um, once the prisoners arrived in the mock jail, they were stripped naked, given rubber shower shoes, and chained around one leg as a constant reminder of their role status. Symbols were used, many symbols in fact, at the prison to show power and status. The guards, for instance, received whistles, billy clubs, uniforms, mirrored sunglasses so that they didn't have a personal identity. Um, prisoners, interestingly, received identical plain outfits, which in fact were women's dresses. Um, they received prisoner identification numbers and headscarves, uh, which were all symbolic of the subordinate status of, uh, to the guards and um, identical inferior statuses of the prisoners. So incidentally, uh, here's an instance of the logic of emasculation, which Zimbardo does not at all weave directly into his theory, that of femininity, femininity used as a means of subordination. By dressing men in women's clothing, this feminizes men both literally and symbolically, as male prisoners were dressed in very plain women's dresses that went down to their knees and were given no undergarments. This outfit uh, symbolizes the forced feminization of prisoners as their clothing is actually gendered in design and revealing as a form of humiliation. The pornography of the outfit itself was that it was literally exposing. In this way, masculinity was taken away through the characterization of prisoners as women and of course without their consent or this would be an entirely different paper. <laughs> um, the actual treatment of sexed men as women, or the feminization of male bodies as punishment or subordination, functioned in this environment to psychologically break down prisoners. What is more, uh, these male prisoners are punished by being treated as uh, women, or symbolically labeled as such, where prisoner is akin to female, and already subjugated uh, group within patriarchal society itself. The punishment here is thus forced feminization, and especially within the heterosexist environment of Zimbardo's experiment. What is interesting within this comparison to the US military is that the military also operates using a creation myth of gender that does little more than perpetuate outdated stereotypes of both gender and sex and their forged association, and all that is tied to heterosexuality or Butler's, uh, of course, heterosexual matrix. Uh, much as Zimbardo's notion of punishment seems to assume. Interestingly, uh, Connell discusses this process of instantiating identity with his distinction between hegemonic and subordinated masculinities, where hegemonic masculinities feminize other masculinities in an attempt to maintain power and control through the act of dominance. Applied to the military, Kaufman Osborne calls this masculinized militarism. 
So during the Stanford prison study, the guards began to additionally use psychological tactics to control the prisoners. They humiliated prisoners to t to by assigning them duties such as cleaning out toilets with their bare hands, called them names, used nakedness, nakedness as a tactic for punishment, and used sexual humiliation. And these, of course, were also used at Abu Ghraib. Uh, within a day, there were signs of stress and anxiety, and prisoners were beginning to feel uh, extreme uh, panic, frustration, and loss of control. And before the first week ended, the situation of abuse had become so bad at uh, Zimbardo's prison study that he actually canceled the experiment totally. But it's important to note that Zimbardo decided to end the experiment as a result of his girlfriend and wife-to-be, Christina Mac Maclatch's strong protestation. Zimbardo had acknowledged her whistleblowing role throughout his writings, and in fact, he dedicates his most recent book, The Lucifer Effect, to her. The significance of this fact for this present analysis is that Matt Latch was the only female voice, the only different voice, in the more than 30-year-old patriarchal and exclusively male-centered narrative of the Stanford prison experiment and its significance. Indeed, she was primarily significant to this experiment, as she was perhaps the reason that the experiment ended. Zimbardo explained the abuse that flowed from the experiment as resulting from the situation and the environment within which the students existed, coupled with their role identification of either guard or prisoner. Behavior was thus explained in terms of situational forces and adherence to roles. However, I find Zimbardo's explanation problematic as he does not consider the effects of gender while claiming, of course, to be concerned with the effects of, of the power of roles upon social environments. It's even further concerning to me that the Stanford prison experiment is used as a comparison by Zimbardo for understanding Abu Ghraib and of course even within uh, the first Abu Ghraib trial. Again, in the Lucifer effect, Zimbardo writes as an extension of his famous experiment applied with reference to quote, good boys gone bad at Abu Ghraib, but does not write about the female soldiers that were there, the female prisoners that were there, officers, lawyers, commanders, girlfriends, and other female roles. Within the social sciences, one of the important questions centers on the construction of knowledge. How is the social scientist influenced by culture when attempting to create objectivity within their experiments? How does culture seep into scientific explanations of the world and in turn come to shape the very world it attempts to explain? The non-inclusion of women in some scientific research is specifically an example of how patriarchal attitude, cultural attitudes shape science where ideal ideas about the world influence the actual way research is approached approach and structured, the kinds of questions that are asked, as well as other aspects. The mistakes of foregoing gender as a concern for critical analysis was a common shortcoming in many of the knowledge constructions and interpretations surrounding Abu Ghraib. Unless one is open to the paradigm of asking questions concerned with gender, then perhaps certain facts might not have been uncovered about Abu Ghraib. In the court martial of both England and Harmon, it came out in testimony that American soldiers imprisoned women and children at Abu Ghraib. Through interviews with soldiers who were witnesses of the trial, I learned that women and children were swept up along with men in disorganized arrest raids, and in some cases were kept as hostages to make men talk during interrogations. What is of great interest is that the US government conceded in open trial that it did keep women and children at Abu Ghraib without charging them with any crime, but never stated the reason for their detention. However, it came out in testimony that women and children were indeed used as means for bargaining, where males could turn themselves in at Abu Ghraib so that their female family members would be released from the prison. The government reports also failed to investigate, so right, there are many government reports into Abu Ghraib, but they also failed to investigate the reasons for detaining women and children. If the backstage reason stated by soldiers is that indeed, and it was stated on uh, the stand in their testimonies, that women and children were held as, ho as hostages, then it seems that the US Army engaged in practices it condemns in its enemies, namely hostage taking. This, to me, is an example of pinkwashing. The soldiers stated they were not asked the reasons for this curious fact while they were testifying on the stand, and thus one of the hidden realities of Abu Ghraib was exposed. Similarities of gender and sexuality between Zimbardo's study and Abu Ghraib do exist. Both situations evidence similar behavior in prisoner care with the use of stress positions where prisoners were hooded, chained, zip-tied, 
stripped naked, and uh, there was frequent uh, restraint of bodies in an attempt to display power. Additionally, uh, abuse at both locations turned sexual. For example, uh, naked Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib were chained in um, stress positions and forced to wear women's panties on their head. In court, several witnesses testified that they were unsure why prisoners at Abu Ghraib were kept naked or why it was the case that some were kept with women's panties on their head. Surely the prisoners arrived at Abu Ghraib with clothing on. Some speculated on the stand that it was simply a supply issue. Others claimed that it was a detention technique. Nonetheless, it was clear, clearly an issue of social control where power was applied to the body in a gendered way that offended cultural constructions of masculinity itself, where the very act of being naked in front of female guards, housed in overcrowded conditions with other naked male prisoners, and further humiliated through the use of panties on one's head, implies both a kind of militarized understanding of feminine vulnerability and homoerotic approach to torture. Additional humiliation of prisoners can be understood through the sexual, sexually humiliating punishment for prisoners at Abu Ghraib with orders from guards to, quote, get down and fuck the floor. Also at Abu Ghraib, male prisoners were ordered to simulate fellatio with each other, to masturbate with each other, and to roll around on the floor naked with each other. This is an example, uh, all examples, these are all examples of guards toying with prisoners to establish control through the use of raw sex and sexuality. We can understand this process in terms of homo-nationalistic torture, where homoerotic techniques are used against the othered prisoner, assumed to be terrorist, of course, as a means to establish control and within a war zone. What is really interesting is that none of the prisoners at Abu Ghraib had any actionable intelligence, not one. In comparison, at the Stanford experiment, there was a mock wedding between the Bride of Frankenstein played by one male prisoner, and Frankenstein, of course, played by another, where these prisoners were forced to say, I love you, Frankenstein, to his male pseudo, presumably heterosexual wife. One prisoner is depicted in this arrangement with his arms around the other. Both bodies are forcibly pressed together by the guard. Nonetheless, these explanations put into focus the military's reliance upon the heterosexual ma matrix for its practice of gender torture and its ability to manipulate the social and cultural environment for heterosexist <coughs> and misogynist techniques used against detainees. <coughs> this is one of the reasons that I argue that heterosexuality is the organizing sexuality, or logic, in the American military, where, where until recently, gays and lesbians were not legally allowed to openly serve their country given the don't ask, don't tell laws. And we can see these kinds uh, of value and attitudes existing beyond the institutional level of the military and within larger culture itself. Simply because laws are passed or revoked, whatever the situation may be, does not, does not mean that equality has been gained. The US military pinkwashes democratic ideals of gay rights and women's rights with their masculinist and also heterosexist paradigm of value, all the while paying outward lip service to issues of equality within the military. Nonetheless, we do see very clear illustrations of both gender and sexuality as the basis for how identities are valued within the military, as well as how torture itself is conceptualized. Finally, I think that what is theoretically interesting might be to ask the question, if now, after the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and of course, now that women have equal rights in the military, what with their ability to fight on the front lines, how might we question what value within, within the military looks like? Inversely, we may ask, what perhaps might an abject status look like by asking the question, what might future abuse look like? I argue that the theoretical power in things like forced feminization and homoerotic torture are twofold. First, the practice of torture identifies a so-called deviant group in need of punishing, thereby creating a group to other and then links this group to an already established and socially oppressed group as their punishment. The irony, of course, is that neither sexism nor homophobia are officially tolerated or sanctioned by US military law or the UCMJ. Yet these practices appear in the form of torture and humiliation, as well as within the history of social disvalue within the military. Interestingly, putting a spin on the discourse surrounding homonationalism can help to explain how the other prisoner at Abu Ghraib was identified as a sexual deviant, sexualized 
deviant, and tortured as such, and specifically when feminized and sexually eroticized. The acceptable queer at the time of the Abu Ghraib torture was, of course, the closeted soldier who was under the gaze of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, G-A-V-E, right, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, <laughs> and thus was not a spectacle of homoeroticism. In closing, Zimbardo does not consider the obvious fact that any context, such as a prison, even, has mitigating factors that flow from outside that context, such as culture itself, <coughs> inward to the prison, and affect the social climate, shape the individuals who are part of that environment, and replicate cultural power differentials, including authority, but definitely not limited to that, within those contexts themselves. Indeed, cultural flow can even shape how torture and deviance are enacted and gendered. What is, what is missing in Zimbardo's paradigm for explaining the abuse at Abu Ghraib and what is within his Stanford prison experiments is definitely an analysis of the connections with regard to power, gender, and sexuality. And this kind of analysis helps to explain uh, the homoerotic nature of the abuse and the evidence uh, sexualized and feminized torture techniques. So I would like to start off by thanking uh, Sarah Schulman and Flags and Community Graduate Center for making this uh, possible. Um, my project uh, that I'm presenting to you today comes out of a, a bigger project where I'm looking primarily at literary texts to, um, or literary texts that uh, critique state power at um, specific moments of um, inclusion of minority difference, um, pretty much since the end of World War II. Um, and I'm looking at specifically at uh, figures that I call sissy intellectuals or writers where a sissy figure is used to make these sorts of um, critiques. So I'm going to begin by um, explaining a little bit of the language I used to frame that argument and then move <coughs> into um, an example. So the sissy critique comes out of the experiential analysis articulated in queer of color critique and women of color feminism. A sissy is physically weak, pacifist, effeminate, and likely homosexual, among other characteristics. This seemingly unwanted subject formation does get some claimed scholarship, usually mentioned within a list of other legible subject formations under the state. In fact, one inspiration to write about the sissy figure comes at the end of Rod Ferguson's book, Aberrations in Black. Here, Ferguson recalls looking at a photo taken in 1938 from his hometown. The photo is at a train station and depicts four black men and signs marking colored waiting room and colored men above the restroom. Ferguson explains that, quote, the traditional historiography of race in America presents black men as the central characters in the history of, the, of exclusion. But he wonders, where were the familiar faces of black queer subjects? Quote, where, for instance, is the transgendered man who wore Levi's held up by suspenders? or the sissy who played for us on Sunday mornings. He insists that it is not enough to merely recognize their existence. We must approach these subjects as sites of knowledge. My goal here is to propose a critique of state power from the critical position of a sissy figure. The state power I mean to focus on is the incorporation of difference since what Howard Wynan calls the racial break following World War II. The civil rights movement, immigration reform, and the institutionalization of multiculturalism are a few examples of moments when the state has found success in absorbing some groups of racial and gender difference in order to dilute social movements and to gain more resources for its imperialist vision. The criterion for the incorporation into the nation state at each of these moments is the affirmation of masculinity and violence, or what I will call militarized masculinity. Militarized masculinity is an ideology of exceptionalism that transcends the literal boundaries of military spaces and bodies to the national public. It values discipline and docility, and it means that one is ready to man up to the challenge put to them. Acts of violence are primarily legitimate under militarized masculinity because they are rationalized as measures of safety and necessity. To achieve this new 
privileged status of militarized masculinity for newly incorporated individuals means to assimilate to its terms of acceptability. The sissy is a dissident subject formation that is unable to or refuses to affirm the state's rubric of, for inclusion and recognition. For those very qualities the sissy possesses that uh, we might think of as powerless, weakness, effeminacy, and otherworldliness, have the productive potential to make up a resistant, antithetical mode to state power through their disidentification with it. And to be sure, the sissy is not a single universal critique, but one connected to its time. I'd like to offer a reading of one contemporary moment of the incorporation of difference by the state. On September 20th, 2011, the repeal of the official policy, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, became a pivotal moment in United States history as it marks the moment of inclusion of homosexuality into the most powerful institution in the country. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a policy that tried to combine military's rights of domination with an individual's right of privacy. Prior to the repeal, the official policy allowed for the violent policing and summary eviction of perceived homosexuality within the military. In fact, more than 13,000 service members were discharged because of this mandated policy. In his book, Freedom with Violence, Chandon Reddy explains, quote, it is not because homosexuality restricts the military's rights of domination or resists its power that the military pursues this imaginary threat beyond all rationality. Rather, it does so as the only way to prove to itself that those bodies that travel as the right of privacy within the military space are precisely what mark its limits of perceiving the military. These legal limits become the target of the institution's seemingly paranoid violence, turning the subject of privacy into what lies beyond the, military, the military's jurisdiction. This practice produces an otherness that closely tied the offending homosexual with the military's racial enemy. In his statement on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, President Obama said, quote, I was proud to sign the repeal act into law because I knew that it would enhance our national security increase our military readiness and bring us closer to the principles of equality and fairness that define us as Americans. The idealistic nature of this statement links Americans' fear and need for security to abstract claims of equality. It articulates the double move of affirming homosex homosexuality through the acceptance of militarism and violence. The significance of this moment then cannot be overstated. The recognition of homosexuality within this particularly masculine and violent U.S. institution signals the realization of homonationalism, or the emergence of a national homosexuality that corresponds with the coming out of American empire. The repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy is a moment where the state's normative power extends to name a new normal, gay soldier. This soldier enters a privileged space in the national imaginary, and his place there is dependent upon upholding the tenets of militarized masculinity ideology. So even as the gay and lesbian community achieves representation in the military, it is simultaneously fractured into complicit good subject formations and abject illegible values. Take, for instance, the YouTube video posted by 21-year-old Airman Randy Phillips on the evening of the repeal that Don't Ask, Don't Tell became official. Phillips, stationed in Germany, informs viewers that he is about to come out to his father, who lives in Alabama, over the phone. The video went viral on the internet, accumulating nearly six and a half million views, and was picked up by all major network and cable media. Phillips' video does not uniquely capture a coming out experience per se. Coming out is steeped in the anxiety of violence, loss, and abandonment, and Phillips articulates this anxiety when he prefaces his reason for calling home by asking his father if he will, quote, love him no matter what. That Phillips' father responds with love and acceptance is a heartening moment and likely the reason for the media attention given to his narrative. What is unique about the Phillips example is that a new genre emerged from this post on Aston Tell moment, a kind of cyber-driven coming out teleology. The New York Times reported that since Phillips' YouTube fame, more than 5,000 videos identified by the term coming out were uploaded to the site within the week following the repeal, and over 12,000 in a month. Certainly, Phillips' exposure demonstrates how public policy permeates and polices private behavior. <coughs> but one danger in the immediate post on Ask, Don't Tell era, in which a gay soldier's exposure has grown significantly, is the assumption that coming out will be met in similar fashion to the way Phillips experienced it. 
many of the issues with the It Gets Better campaign sounded out by queer voices in communities, um, namely that it uh, reproduces uh, normative narratives of progress tied closely with white middle class values, um, apply here as well. Indeed, if we read Phillips's narrative as a social text, we will note that the new formations that constitute the good legitimate gay military subject. He is so because he remains white, middle class, attractive, able-bodied, and patriotic. Um, and if you watch the video, you, uh, even if you just hit the pause button, you'll note that he's sort of this built uh, blonde guy in a tight white t-shirt who's holding the red solo cup, and he has like a map of the world behind him. So it's, um, it's an interesting still to read. So through the co-opting of his narrative, Philip's favorable exposure in the media suggests he is the face of the new good uh, gay subject, gay soldier subject formation, one that is masculine and militaristic. However, at the very moment where public and private subjectivities, soldier and gay, intersect at, in a newly legible space, the US military, bad subject formations, namely sissy figures, become both less visible and more vulnerable to rationalized state violence. Mm -hmm. Certainly the inclusion and recognition of gay and lesbian soldiers in the military allows the American imaginary to see possibility for the same incorporation in other institutions. However, that brand of homosexual is homonormative in a way that reifies existing structures of, accept of acceptability. To contrast, the appropriation of the Phillips narrative to promote the military's liberal credentials, we need only look to Private Bradley Mann. The 25-year-old soldier accused of leaking classified military documents has now been detained without trial in the US military prison system for longer than any other case in military history. Incapable of authoring his own narrative, what we know about Manning has been dictated by the chat logs between him and hacker journalist Adrian Remo, and more recently in his statement before the military court in Fort Meade. Initial media coverage of his story has thoroughly pathologized Manning speculating that, his, uh, or that he is mentally unstable and that his sexual orientation or the motivation for selling out his country to WikiLeaks. The current administration is determined to make a lesson of Manning by aggressively arguing that he is complicit in aiding the enemy. In fact, just yesterday the trial announced that a Marine uh, who is part of the Osama bin Laden raid um, will testify for the prosecution. Manning himself notes that for, quote, some bizarre reason, he believes the information he leaks is important to get out and that it, quote, might actually change something. What's worth noting about the media coverage of Manning is the effort taken to tie Manning to unpatriotic qualities, sissy qualities, and punish him accordingly. The unprecedented length of his incarceration without trial suggests the nation's attempt to assimilate and catalog the effusive discomfort of unknowability that Private Manning represents. Phillips and Manning are two national narratives that speak to the power of militarized masculinity in deciding who gets privileged and who remains illegible in the context of human nationalism. While the implications of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell are still settling in, we can look to the Brand Israel campaign as a kind of precedent to where we might be headed. In seeking to depict Israel as a country relevant and modern in the Middle East, the Brand Israel campaign quickly became criticized for the co-opting of white gay people by anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim uh, political forces in Western Europe and Israel. It is worth asking if a post don't ask don't tell militarism is not a similar move. The need for new ways of discussing militaristic subject formations post don't ask don't tell became alarmingly present when Master Sergeant Anthony Henry, a top Marine recruiting trainer, was invited to set up a recruiting booth in Tulsa, Oklahoma's largest gay community center. Although very few potential recruits solicited information from Sergeant Henry, the presence of military recruiting and LGBT centers proved a resourceful public relations tool. Indeed, the Marines said that the bust in recruiting had been made up for in media exposure. Sergeant Henry and his public affairs officer gave interviews at the center with five local television stations, three print reporters, and one correspondent for National Public Radio. The immediate danger presents itself through the rhetoric of the gate gatekeeper. Sergeant Henry says, my take is if they can make it through our boot camp, which is the toughest boot camp in the world, then they ought to have the opportunity to wear the uniform. 
This language is steeped in the inclusivity dependent on passing. To pass, then, is to seek legibility through the state by subscribing to and perpetuating normative politics and behavior to affirm militarized masculinity. Consequently, the military is now welcome to actively recruit another demographic of disenfranchised, disenfranchised people under the guise of liberal inclusion. The Phillips narrative gives evidence to a moment that is liberating in the public and private sphere for gay and lesbian soldiers, but its prevalent intention may also have constituted a new subject formations that are impossible for many queer people to exist legitimately in. Phillips, as representative of the good military subject formation, profits from his racial and masculine gay status. Such status moved toward a homonationalism that echoes its Israeli counterpart. Manning represents the sissy subject formation and therefore subject to don't ask, don't tell treatment, where the offending homosexual and the racial enemy were closely tied together in the military. He is a queer body within the military who looks a lot like Airman, Airman Phillips, but indeed a body that could not be anticipated nor is comprehensible to the institution he worked for and lived in, effectively making him what Jesper and Jesper Poir and Amit Ray call a monster terrorist. The recent tie to information in the Bin Laden raid reinforces a determined effort to align Manning with, the, with this racial enemy. Yet his sissy subject formation provides a powerful critique of the US state power precisely because of its refusal of militarized masculinity. He dared to give transparency to the, quote, crazy, almost criminal political back dealings, the non-PR version of world events and crises, or crises. So what I hope to have done today um, right now is a reading of a contemporary moment where sexual difference has been incorporated into the state to work in the normative mode. That moment is the repeal of don't ask, don't tell policy. Through mobilization of the rubric of militarized masculinity, the narrative of Airman Randy Phillips became an opportunity to brand a new gay soldier and thus a new American militarism. Private Bradley Manning's failure to affirm the tenets of militarized masculinity effectively framed him as a traitorous sissy, one who is locked up in awaits trial. A critique from the critical position of a sissy figure illuminates the cost of inclusion and recognition into the state, most important of which is that things are not so different as before. Thank you. interested for this project in seeing um, how we didn't get Manning's um, narrative dictated to us from Manning himself in the way that Phillips was able to deliver it from himself, right? So all we had to go on were these um, pieces of, of chat log that were um, released and, and then the statement that just came out of the month or so. Um, and what's telling for me, or at least that I was interested in this project is how he was calling out the U.S. Um, on several issues, mostly like that the war has become a, a sort of kill list, and that it has bloodlust, um, and that those were fitting in very similarly to the, the literary uh, text I was looking at um, for the civil rights movement, and, and so on, and so. My reading was that I was interested in, 
in how his narrative was situated closely, very closely racialized to the sort of sissy figure that I'm, I'm figuring um, in, in those texts, and um, how this process to um, put him up as sort of the lesson, uh, the disciplinary lesson for anyone who deviates from, from this type of uh, unpatriotic behavior or whatever, um, will, will be prosecuted, will be treated. So uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I could maybe talk to you after a little bit about how I'm drawing it up and how we go back and forth. But um, yeah, I wanted to align him with a sort of racialized sissy and how under the don't ask, don't tell policy that um, racialized enemy has always sort of, the city has always sort of existed within that. Um, mm -hmm. that uh, I actually have a, a question and comment that puts the two of your presentations kind of in, in conversation with each other because, you know, Tyler Wilde, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is a, is a key um, analytic lens for you. Um, I think as, um, as Ryan said, what's also happening simultaneously is uh, a rethinking of the role of female combatants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it, it seems to me that we, we really have to, if we're thinking about militarized masculinity, we need to think about what those, uh, put those two policy um, changes into a conversation with each other. Um, you know, and at the same time, Ryan, I think that, I mean, and, and those are certainly yeah. issues that you take up, but I, I think also as what comes through in Tyler's presentation is an important perspective on um, <coughs> the issue of privacy itself, right? And, and it, again, it seems to me that, that the question about how you think about privacy or privacy and its translation into public <coughs> policy, and which I think is a key point that you touched on, Tyler, is an undercurrent to what you've talked about, but isn't um, because privacy and who's, who's public and who's private is actually so fundamental to the dynamics that you're talking about. So I wonder if you could both speak to those issues, you know, and again, I, I really didn't, actually when I read your abstracts, I thought about the two of them together. So. Um, uh, and that really comes through, I think, even more in the presentations. So maybe you could both talk a little bit about that. Are you there? Well, actually, one of the things I was going to say, um, even in regard to your, um, if, and even, okay, well, in regard to your uh, presentation and actually your question, um, this whole notion of uh, masculinized um, militarism, and even with, right, women getting, what's it, like, now able to fly helicopters, mm -hmm. now able to fight on the front lines, now, you know, getting more and more opportunity, I suppose, um, to do things in the military, is that, uh, I mean, I understand these um, sort of ways that identity are formed very much in terms of, like, Simone de Beauvoir's notion of forming an identity. It's not so much that uh, women are able to, uh, you know, freely now um, create their gendered identity, but it's always in terms of something, right? And in my mind, right, this, this very, um, specific notion of masculinity, and I can even connect it to what you're talking about, this idea of the sissy, uh, because in the trials that I worked on, um, one of sort of the calls um, that were made uh, by uh, two of what were um, pointed out to be the ringleaders of abuse, um, when uh, prisoners were brought down um, to be searched and then uh, brought up to be interrogated by um, CID, um, Criminal Investigative Division, um, was this, and so like different soldiers were, you know, testifying, um, you know, well, why didn't you go and abuse prisoners when these other soldiers didn't? And um, so the call was, um, you know, let's go get some. So right, so again, very sexualized, and don't be a pussy. Literally, I mean, they're saying this on the stand, and I'm thinking like, oh my god, this is great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, did they really say pussy? And they said, yeah, I'm like, yes, you know. And, uh, sitting next to me and he's like, I don't, I'm like, I have no idea what the significance of this for gender and sexuality, right? And um, so, right, it's like, <laughs> or, like, for my analysis, right? And um, so, like, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, like, when you're sitting here talking about, right, like, the sissy 
subject, right? I mean, definitely, like, the soldiers who were not, like, performing this, like, strong, masculine, soldier, militarized notion of gender, um, they're a pussy, right? And, like, what does that even mean, right? And so I'm, a, I'm kind of connecting it here with, like, your idea of sissy, right? And so where then do, do where does anyone, for that matter, get to uh, really understand their gender identity? Right? I mean, it, it's, there's just sort of this like normative construction of what gender should look like, and anyone outside of that normative construction is sort of deviating from it, right? And so um, when we even talk about um, like public or private um, lives, uh, in fact, one of the soldiers, Sabrina Harmon, is an open lesbian and was, mar was married at the time. Her wife actually testified in the trials, and one of the, uh, the I remember the, um, head of the defense, uh, attorney uh, Frank Spinner, said at her trials, like, this is perfect for the military. You know, they're not only charging her with crimes that she didn't commit, because in fact, not one person testified at the trial, which, by the way, are all on, um, I've made all the court martials uh, trials, like papers available on iTunes. Because the, right, the military does not make them public. Uh, so they're all on iTunes under Texas A&M University court martial trials for crimes. Um, <laughs> so England, Harmon, really all the trials I've ever worked on. Um, and, uh, you know, he was saying, like, they're really killing two birds with one stone, right? Um, they are prosecuting a soldier who has no evidence against her for participating in any, um, you know, deviances um, other than perhaps being gay, right? And so now they're also prosecuting her for that because, of course, it was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Sure. Um, I'm sort of forgetting the question a little bit, but to address the idea of um, female combatants, it's always something um, I'm, in my project I'm trying to figure out. Is there like a, a female equivalent to the sissy, um, or is, the, is it too essentialist to say that a sissy yeah. has to be um, biologically? Um, um, but in, in terms of the military, at least the way I'm seeing still that heteronormative bolstered by homonormative now um, mentality or ideology still exists. So even if you are female and you want to do like fly the helicopters down the front line, you still have to sort of man up to, right. to mm -hmm. that project. Yeah, that mm -hmm. whole man up thing. Right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And I, I don't think it, I mean, I think there's a reading of it that can be not essentialized to like a right. specific sex or gender, right? With just these kind of normative qualities, right? Like being tough, being strong, right. not being scared, you know. Thanks. Um, so uh, if you keep it very short, I want—I don't want to um, go on for too long because we have two more presentations. So let me ask whether you are, whether you must ask the question now, <laughs> whether you can hold it till after the next two presentations, or if you must okay. speak now, by all means, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted you to must. add a piece in real quick um, about a piece that I feel is missing here that's part of the. Um, Militarized masculinity, you know, there's the sexual abuse of, of prisoners, I agree, but also the sexual abuse that happens within course, the military, where you know, mm -hmm. one in three women are okay. facing uh, military sexual trauma. Um, so that's just a piece that I wanted to bring as part of the same structure, um, uh, and also how the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell has, in a lot of ways, um, so undermine the um, the anti-war movement because when soldiers like against the war are coming out um, and coming out as queer or whatever, then the emphasis is always on like, oh, well, what do you how do you feel about Don't Don't Tell, and not about you know just distracting from from the war from you know. So they're not talking about off the grave; they're talking about. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I would even just say briefly, um, you know, there's so many effects of the war that I don't yeah. think people realize that, you know, every year it's like, oh, well, this is the new highest year for all of these things. Oh, this is the new highest year, and that, you know, is in the form of things like um, PTSD, alcohol and drug mm -hmm. abuse, yeah. suicides, um, rape, of course, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, there, it, it's astonishing um, the levels of all of those sorts of things. Um, and it does, right, it of course affects the soldiers. And I'm going to take that as the opportunity to <laughs> introduce the next paper because, in fact, it, it does very much take up questions about 
universality and normalcy and what these mean within this broader context. So with that, Mark, uh, Mark, I don't know how to Bukai. Bukai, um, who is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Right from the beginning, like from the beginning, the top. Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, in this paper, I do a lot of theoretical content, con concepts, but I don't really talk about them. If you're interested in talking about queer utopia, futurity, um, biopolitics, please come talk to me about that afterwards, because that's the kind of theoretical place this is set in, even if I don't go into those details too much in this version. Kiss Impossible, Negotiating Gay Empathy and Queer Political Consciousness. Is it possible to stage a queer utopian performative at a time of war? Lance Corporal Jeff Key seems to think so. Is made clear by his one-man show, The Eyes of Babylon, adapted from diaries documenting his tour as a reserve fighter in Iraq in 2003. Although seemingly following many of the tropes of queer solo performance, who plays more about his anti-war stance than his sexual orientation. Even though, like, for example, in the first scene, he's in his underwear, kind of Tom Finland style, <laughs> talking about his experiences. Um, indeed, it seems to be by and through his political descent that this Marine attempts to transcend his own stigmatized homosexuality. A vignette from a piece titled The Kiss is the only part of Key's play that makes clear the protagonist's sexual orientation. He describes himself atop my vehicle in Badra with my weapon at the ready. One quote, a man in his early 20s passes on the opposite side of the street. End quote. This man is fit and good looking in that brooding, Middle Eastern sort of a way. <laughs> T follows him with his eyes and gets leave from his fellow corporal to go down the street. The two men greet each other in Arabic and English, exchanging names and a handshake. We grip hands tight and resist letting go just long enough so as to not get busted. We exchange small talk as much as possible for a few minutes, and I begin to wonder if, I don't know, I want more. There's no way we can do anything but I'm desperate for a verbal acknowledgement of what we both know. He figures out how. You have wife? He asks me. No. No wife. You? No wife, he answers. And then his beautiful brown eyes lit up. I'm a sucker for brown eyes. Why, he says again, flirting. We're making that big time with our words. You're beautiful, he says quietly, as his eyes dart around to make sure no one hears. Yeah, you're beautiful too. You can see the electricity in the air between us, and my cabin bottoms are getting tighter by the second. <laughs> I think he's having the same problem. We stand there enjoying the torture of our situation. You have, and then he pantomimes lip balm. I dig into my pocket and produce my dirty, half-used tube. I gotta tell you, I don't think anyone's ever put lip balm on in a sexier way. What you call, and he kisses the air. What's this? I ask him making the kissing noise. Yes, kiss, we call it kiss. Kiss, he repeats, and hands back the chapstick. No, no, you keep it. I put in my hand <laughs> up to refuse it. Kiss, he repeats, and pushes it into my palm. Well, I'll be damned, he's given me a kiss. I smooth the stuff onto my own lips as he watches. And so then there's a, this moment that, that happens. Key's staging of this particular section u utilizes the theatrical medium to amplify the pastoral contours of the tale. Utilizing the power of his imagination, Key's words and eyes bring the Iraqi boy into being in front of the audience. Through Key's challenging a state of sensual, sexual arousal, we see the boy. He uses no accent to imitate him, keeping Ahmed, his name, a sense memory, a sensual memory. Amidst the insanity of war, a human moment of profound connection is staged. Key's moment of recognition does truly bring into being a moment of what Munoz, Jill Dolan, and a bunch of other theorists would call queer utopia, a fleeting snapshot of a better world. It is the spectatorial desire to see this image's fulfillment that makes the kiss a visceral effective moment of live performance. Um, in an interview, Key makes clear what is so sexy and seductive about this impossible kiss. Again, Alabama, as we were talking about. I grew up in, in rural Alabama, so my gator is a very fine-tuned instrument. <laughs> During my brief stay in the Middle East, I would see the man in the crowd, on the street, in the market, those Iraqi versions of me, trying their best to get along in a horrible situation. 
When a man finds himself a part of something like horror, he must let himself believe that he is here for a good reason. Where eyes would meet, and whatever it is that, happen, that happiness would happen, so much would happen in just that split second. The volumes of communication that can occur in nanosecond is, unbelievable, is an unbelievable phenomenon. Perhaps it is a survival mechanism given to our tribe. Um, no irony there, by our creator. <laughs> Indeed, Key's reference to those Iraqi versions of me indicates a commensurability between himself and gay Iraqis. Does this equal recognition extend to other Iraqis, women, and straight men? It would seem not. Queer connectivity and conviviality, volumes of communication, seem to be the keys to this identification. Such effective moments of communicative eye contact have lately been theorized as a priori chaotic and following who are as viscous and sticky, catching subjects in their interconnected web, sticky like lip balm, you could say. <laughs> Here, through the conjuring of a gay tribe, they are also magical, allowing certain Iraqis and certain Americans to transcend other forms of difference. At least that is Key's account of it. He imagines real connection with these Iraqi queers, but there is no Iraqi voice to affirm or deny this purported reciprocity. His sense of gay connection seems to blind him from the more complicated and problematic aspects of his intercultural kiss. Key's sexy utopian is once historically specific and ahistoric, dependent on a socio-political reality, and yet insistently apolitical. Perhaps inadvertently, the kiss recalls a famous scene in Martin Sherman's Bent, where two gay, men, two gay men in a Nazi work camp have sex while standing next to each other, never touching, being watched by a guard pointing a gun directly at them. Sherman's intensely sensual scene even includes a moment of climax in which they reach ejaculation while remaining rigidly still. That makes Key's exchange of lip balm seem timid. Yet in both scenes, the impossibility of full physical consummation only underscores the extent to which queer affect may be endangered by the apolitical force of the moment at hand and indifferent to the structures of power that limit their expression. The power of queer connection, the stickiness of affect, if you will, is concretized in these two scenarios. In one, there is the stickiness of actual release. In the other, the stickiness of the lip balm that lubricates the participant's public intercourse. Still, even as both of these scenes evoke similar sensations, there is an important difference. Whereas Sherman's piece involves two gay prisoners of war engaging in what is arguably a strategy of survival, the Marine Key is both guard and prisoner, a victim and an enforcer of the American imperial project. No doubt, this dynamic explains why the kiss, again, the only scene in Key's play to explicitly touch upon the playwright's homosexuality, does not detract from the work's coherence. Rather, the case functions as one more protest against the war that enables it. Two utopian visions, one queer, one pacifist, merge. Though it is easy to be swept away by the utopian sensuality quivering in the kiss, transnational queer and feminist scholarship would counsel spectators to resent this sentimentality. He's insistent reference to a gay tribe lies a colonizing or at least homogenizing impulse behind what is pitched as a moment of equal recognition. Key's characterization of Ahmed and other, um, and other query caught by his gaydar, his Iraqi versions of me, exemplify what Desbir Pilar and Joseph Massan would call respectively the homo national and the gay international. He assumes that Ahmed is gay in the same sense that he himself is gay. He imposes his ethical and moral values, assuming the youth is sexually open and Western in his outlook, never considering that the boy might be gay and Muslim or might sleep with men without any connection to occidental concepts of identity, like gay or queer. Moreover, as mentioned above, he never really questions how the content of his interaction with the gay Iraqi versions of me are conditioned by his obvious membership in military. Mm -hmm. It is as if Key's queerness negated his nationality and his weapon, an effect that becomes particularly clear if one imagines a scene similarly devoid of outright coercion involving a heterosexual version of Key and a female Iraqi. You know, get that image in your mind. <laughs> Under this critical view, Key's pacifist and sexy story of queer recognition may actually be, or also be, a story of hegemony, one that in itself and in its telling creates no change in the world. Mm -hmm. Key believes that there is a way to have gender and racial difference without any differentiation in power, and utilizes his magical kiss as one such moment to demonstrate its feasibility. In Key's utopian vision, Queerness is a subjectivity with which subjects have no fear, only pride, 
quote, in us, in our people, in our everlasting overcoming, in our ability to love, to show love no matter what, quote, and that we queers everywhere, quote, are love and we shall overcome, end quote. <laughs> Overcoming, however, seems to be replete with its own set of unwittingly gendered and racialized assumptions. For example, from the onset of the interaction, he assumes the role of top, showing off his, quote, best cowboy American marine swagger. He plays man to the Iraqi boy as a woman, the powerful soldier to the power of a civilian. The scene ends just as it begins with King giving his, quote, best cowboy American marine jumping on his horse leap, end quote. The proud virile American made virile by his erotic triumph over the feminized other. Key's sense of queer connectivity and belonging to a gay tribe allows him to depoliticize his subject position, seeing them both as equal. In the kiss, queer connection and the sense of equal recognition that stems from it is a panacea for all forms of social ills and the negative effects of totalitarianism. In Key's piece, the moan of recognition and sexual attraction is wrapped in an uncomfortable discourse that conjures up some concept of a gay universal completely forgetting what normative race and gendered structures of power are left intact in the claim of such a universe. Moreover, the effective sensations created by the utopian hopefulness of Key's kiss works to cover up and blind one to the more neo-colonialist aspects of the tale. The effective power of the scene, and it is it's sexy, it makes you almost cry, even if you know how problematic it is, at least for me. Um, the effective power of the scene erases one's ability to think intellectually about the material. In other words, Rex leader of the alienation, this is most definitely not. <laughs> As Key makes clear in the documentary Semper Fi and Marine's Journey, he had a whole documentary about him on Showtime that aired in 2008. Before deploying to Iraq, he read up on the history of Islam in an effort to quote, know my enemy. What he learned through his experience as an occupying peacekeeper was that someone, quote, had suddenly switched the enemy. End quote. It was no longer Islam, but George Bush and the American right, forcing the people to fight a war for no reason other than to prove that, quote, they were the biggest, baddest boys club in the world, end quote. Although intellectually aware of the stakes of the US war in Iraq, he inadvertently uses the rhetoric of being one of the biggest, baddest boys to rule a potential sexual partner, saturating audience members in a well-told tale of queer, queer connection, blinding one to the ways in which Key's sexy kiss may be complicit with histories of patriarchy, colonialism, and imperial power. Is there a way to have our utopian cake and eat it too? To enjoy a moment like this and simultaneously stay aware of the ways in which the implication of such a universal does politically regressive work? Can we empathize without inadvertently recolonizing the mind? Although I have no concrete answer to these questions, the work on homo nationalism that this conference is interested in um, sets the stage for finding ways of negotiating what Warren Burland would call the ambivalence between what we feel and what we know, between gay forms of empathy and queer just becoming forms of affiliation and radical consciousness. Thank you very much. Um, and moving on to the final presentation, um, Nathaniel? Yeah. Um, well, um, sort of in, in honor of the title of this panel, um, what I would like to do is meditate on what it looks like for the United States to be at war, um, specifically in relation to the so-called domestic sphere or the home front. Um, now, conventional wisdom separates uh, matters of foreign policy from matters domestic. Um, and this division is in many ways arbitrary. And what I would like to do is explore the relations between war and matters domestic and between the so-called culture wars and US militarism. Um, now, many of us recall the sorts of jokes and memes that circulated during the debates last fall between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, specifically those involving Big Bird, women in binders and horses and bayonets. Um, now, we also recall that early in the year, as Obama was gearing up for his re-election campaign, he did something that many people refer to as historic. Um, he became the first sitting president to endorse same-sex marriage, um, shifting from a previous stance um, in favor of civil unions, but not full-on marriage. Um, he said, I've been going through an evolution on this issue, end quote. 
Um, now, if Obama was evolving, uh, then what did that mean for Romney? Uh, this sort of vulture capitalist whose great grandfather fled to Mexico to practice polygamy. Um, what sort of affective tendencies um, are activated in the imagining of Romney as this unevolved, bully, plutocrat, Mormon, planning to kill off Big Bird and storm the White House with horses, bayonets, and women in binders? Um, uh, what about Obama, um, this sort of smart power tactician who was poised to lead the nation forward if it wasn't for those darned obstructionist Republicans being all recalcitrant? And um, in what ways are these imaginative constructs um, imbued with affective investments that are articulated around a reduction of political struggle to a sort of tug of war between forward thinking progressives and benighted retrograde conservatives? Um, in what ways does Obama's evolution on matters domestic? tied to the transformation of executive power from the clunky and extravagant wars of George W. Bush to the lean and surgical war making of Obama. Um, so what I would like to do then is consider this interplay between the foreign and the domestic, between horses and bayonets on the one hand and Big Bird and women in binders on the other. Um, to this end, what I would like to do is think through this notion of American exceptionalism, specifically on its religious or theological character. Um, um, first, um, to that end, what I would like to do first is touch upon the religious genealogy of American exceptionalism, specifically the notion that uni the United States is this sort of city on a hill. Now, this phrase, city on a hill, it itself um, traces back to John Winthrop's 1630 sermon in which um, he was a Puritan leader and he enjoined fellow settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony to erect a city upon a hill, um, this new Jerusalem of sorts where the Puritans would establish a godly civic order. Um, so after I do that, I would like to consider how this history informs the perception by those on the religious right that increased sexual permissiveness has led God to remove his hand of protection from the United States. Um, I would like to consider how such notions have fed into and have been informed by discourses of American exceptionalism and national security. Finally, I would like to consider how these religiously imbued complaints about lapses into sexual depravity have been inverted by liberal and secularist discourses that on the one hand render sexual liberation or sexual liberty as a mode of moral uprightness, modernity, and evolutionary progress, and on the other hand, how these discourses render so-called puritanical sexual others, such as Muslims and the American Christian right, as repressive and even extremist avatars of sexual and cultural perversity. Um, if the Christian right is regarded as some kind of American Taliban, um, then in what ways are perceptions of Muslims in lands occupied by the United States structured by the same liberal, secular, and progressivist imaginaries that form, inform cultural discourses um, and the perception that American Christians, particularly those living in the red states, are backwards, repressive, and unevolved. Um, in what ways does this need to quarantine these so-called extremists uh, uncritically replicate both official narratives about threats to the state and constructions of the terrorists that legitimize US militarism abroad? In what ways does this emphasis on the violence, diabolical villainy, and atavistic recalcitrance of so-called whack job religious extremists collude with the everyday violences of neoliberalism and US imperialism. Um, so in regard with American exceptionalism, we, what we see is we see this long-standing tendency to construe the exceptional nature of the United States theologically. Um, whether we're citing American, or whether somebody's citing American religiosity as a source of natural, national excellence, uh, whether one's reading the U.S. as a sort of promised land given by God to a chosen people, 
or whether one is viewing American preeminence as a sign of God's blessing and as a divine mandate to spread the gospel of the American way to all corners of the earth. Uh, now this history, um, like I mentioned, sort of informs these Christian right Jeremiads that lament increased sexual permissiveness as inviting God's disfavor upon the nation. Uh, one instance of which being uh, Jerry Falwell's rather infamous September 13, 2001 remarks on Pat Robertson's 700 Club. Uh, I don't know if people recall it, but uh, for Falwell, uh, God had lifted his hand of protection from the United States, um, thereby opening up the nation for the attacks on 9-11. The city on a hill for Falwell had in many ways become a den of iniquity, and it was, quote, the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians, end quote, who were responsible for making this happen. Um, now, while Falwell's remarks enact this sort of slide between the homosexual and the terrorist, suggesting that homosexuality itself is a kind of terrorism, threatening the safety, integrity, and virtue of the nation. While this is the case, um, one looks at liberal and mainstream reaction against Falwell's so-called hateful remarks, and how they sort of signal the desire for the imagined national community to quarantine and dampen um, such so-called forms of extremism. Um, in other words, to suspend former heteronormativities for the sake of national unity. Um, now the present is in many ways an opportune time to look at US nationalism and Christian heteronormativity in tandem with each other, especially with the kinds of conversations that we're having at this conference and various queer interventions that have sought to read sexuality through phenomena as wide ranging as nationalism, colonialism, US imperialism, Islamophobia, and Israel-Palestine. Um, now these developments have opened up new avenues for discussing religious anti-queer sentiment. And what we can do is we can map these various strands by exploring the sort of range of overlapping rhetoric about so-called Judeo-Christian values. Whether we're talking about Christian right arguments that say that um, homosexuality is contrary to said values, uh, nationalist discourses that construe the U.S. as a Christian nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles, or these Islamic, um, Islamophobic or Christian Zionist positionings of the U.S. and Israel as these beacons of Western Judeo-Christian civilization over against the so-called Muslim world. Um, but we would be remiss um, if we fixated on Christian right investment in the nation state without considering the ways in which progressive and pro-LGBT politics have colluded with national interests. And in many ways, that's the theme of this, uh, this conference, homonationalism and pinkwashing. Um, so again, um, one notes these responses to Falwell that compared him to other so-called religious extremists. Um, like the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. Um, and again, there's this trope that the religious right is a sort of <coughs> American Taliban that seeks to control the bodies of women, is rigidly patriarchal, authoritarian, anti-science, anti-evolution, in addition to being virulently homophobic. Um, now, the sort of missionary and savior discourses around which American exceptionalism is articulated are of particular interest to Jasbir Pur, for whom the ideologies and rhetorics of gender and sexual liberation become enmeshed within the logics and practices of American exceptionalism. Uh, this is what she is talking about when she speaks of US sexual exceptionalism. Uh, one notes images of a sexually free West over against homogeneously repressed Muslim populations. Um, Poor link sexual exceptionalism to notions of queer agential subjectivity, to a queer secularity that in locating transgressiveness as a site of proper agency, finds those who adhere to religious sexual norms as lacking in terms of proper sexual agency. Quote, the queer agential subject can only ever be fathomed outside the norming constrictions of religion. 
So what we see is that sexual liberation um, is no longer the site of perversion and degeneracy, rather those sexualities that are regarded as repressive and puritanical have come to occupy the realm of the perverse. So not only are there the notions that conservative Christians are anti-gay, anti-women, anti-sex, um, um, in tandem with these discourses and discourses about Christian sex being vanilla, discourses about uh, the missionary position, uh, <laughs> what, what we see is these various religious figures emerge whose sexualities are in various ways failed and perverse. So whether we're talking about the failed homosexuality of Ted Haggard, who was this like um, closet gay basher who was a who got caught with a, a gay masseuse, or whether we're talking about uh, Michelle and Marcus Bachman and other Christian wives who are dutifully submissive to their husbands, uh, whether we're talking about ex-gays or virgin co-eds wearing promise mm -hmm. rings or whether we're talking about pedophile priests, polygamous Mormons, sister wives, born-again virgins, or even moms in Arkansas bearing 19 kids and counting, as is the name of one TLC reality yeah. series. Um, so there really is this sort of like rogues gallery or sideshow of these Christian, these holy perverts. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so one thing that I'm interested in is, uh, what does this do discursively, and how do these discourses of the religious right as perverse uh, really, in many ways, collude ideologically with the uh, ideologies of U.S. militarism? And uh, <coughs> what I would claim is that the same sort of liberal, secular, imaginaries that are based on this sort of like progressivist narrative of gradual evolution, um, how these things um, inform simultaneously perceptions of the Christian right and perceptions of the Muslim other, which Poor talks about at length. Now, for the religious right, um, they in many ways become this model of harshness, strictness, irrationality, patriarchal authoritarianism, um, of these tendencies toward cognitive closure that inhibit the kinds of openness needed for the evolution of humanity and the nation. So if we look at American exceptionalism, we see this genealogy in the Puritans and the way that our sorts of cultural imaginaries uh, render the Puritans. They're these sort of like strict, austere, morally rigid, theocratic, they hang witches, they put scarlet letters on adulterers. They, and this very much looks like the image that we have of the Christian right as this American Taliban. Um, and uh, what I would like to do um, um, is make the claim that sexual, the sexual perversion of the religious right is but one manifestation of a larger degeneracy and failure to catch up with modernity, a failed development on both the individual and collective levels that informs a lot of these progressivist discourses of modernity and their collusion with the ideologies of militarism. So, thank you.
uh, to Bradley Manning um, as far as how people, it sounded like you were saying like because uh, people viewed him uh, or uh, connected him with the enemy so as to say like uh, Iraqis or uh, Arabs or anything else, and, um, that that kind of in a way racialized him. Um, I don't know, I didn't quite get uh, what you were saying or how you were, kind of, how you were connecting those. Sure, so I was um, using the framework that uh, Chen Yuri sets up that says, um, during the, when Don't Ask, Don't, Poli uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy was being enforced that homosexuals were, um, closet homosexuals were um, being sort of pursued as that which exists within the institution of the military, but is still unknown. And so that's where all that sort of paranoid, like rationalized uh, violence came out in that, that the fear or the, like the sort of justification for sort of teaming out pursuing that unknown um, within the military space um, had to do, had, well, was linked very closely with this racialized enemy. And so I saw how Bradley Manning was being like, sort of locked up um, in trial, how the media was sort of inconsistently being allowed into the case or not into the case. That's sort of this um, move that very much sort of like aligned with what Freddie was talking about. So even though Manning is like this white guy that just looks very much like Phillips, who is sort of the poster boy for um, a good gay military subject. Um, his, the way that his narrative is being played out is, is very much in, in uh, the way that Reddy talks about how gay soldiers existing in the military um, when the rest of the time was the wisdom. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that it, uh, it's oh, I was just wanting to respond earlier to um, a comment on a question that I think uh, Riley has thrown out in terms of the difference that it might make mm -hmm. now that women are supposed to be able to I think that it's interesting actually to, to speak about that in tandem with now that don't ask what the other has been revealed. So now you have the inclusion purportedly um, of openly gay subjects and women in the military. Mm -hmm. And of course the liberal narrative is that this sort of is going to break down somehow right. the masculinized right. military. And right. we know, right? But of course what we see happening, and it's clear from both your presentations and other um, comments from this um, panel, that what it only does is sort of shore up a hyper masculinity. So it's actually showing up the military as this hyper-masculinized, hegemonic, space of hegemonic masculinity, right? So, so it's no longer all women um, who are the sort of feminine others uh, or all gays that are the sissy mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Now you have the good gay subjects and the exactly. good female subjects supportively, right? The ones who are willing to engage in acts of um, you know, sexualized violence, for example, against others. Um, and or are willing to you know put up and shut up in terms of the violence that they might face in right, the military, right? right? Or, so this right, was yeah. so it's sort of still a boys club, um, a, you know, and a particular kind of boys club, with you know the membership is contingent on your playing by the rules of this hegemonic masculinity, <coughs> whether you're a, a female subject or a gay subject or both, right? Right. I mean, you know, I'm just I'm reminded of uh, you know two, well, two things that both sort of have to do with each other, right? I mean, just because we passed, uh, like, what was it, like the 60s or something, um, civil rights uh, laws, yeah. right? Doesn't mean that racism has right, now, right. you know, been removed from our culture. And um, so I don't know why this is popping into my head, but Paris is burning, right? Yeah. I think of um, you know the movie, and you know, ju you know, we can just because uh, I don't even remember who was saying this in the movie, but it's something like. You know, if we act a certain way or if we look at, then we are it, right? Um, the part or the identity or whatever. And I think that that is what is, is taking place in the military, right? Like, um, if we act these um, certain masculinist ways, then that gives us value as a soldier. And not that it necessarily defines masculinity anywhere else, but right, it's this really unique brand of, um, you know, what counts as a valued identity, right? Kind of. Was Keys I, is, you know, represented by yeah. these. Go ahead. I think in that same concept, at the same point that it's like even more hyper-masculinized, 
in a private sphere, we also want to see the docile patriot in the masculinity. So something else that a couple of my friends and I, I always teach are the videos of soldiers from the barracks performing pop songs all together. I don't know if any of you've seen these YouTube videos. The telephone video. Uh, you know, oh, totally. right? well, that's interesting, right? So, and so yeah. this is like, you have like these super like butch, you know, Marines out there like half naked, totally. And there's something like you, like they get millions of hits. They're fascinating to watch because of the kind of counter mask of what the masculinity of that's usually on display is. But what actually that does is it kind of reinforces a hegemony because it's like, oh, these soldiers that we think of as being so masculine are actually not. Once they get into their into their barracks, they just put on makeup and dance around to Lady Gaga like their little, totally like their little sissies, yes. right? And that <laughs> reinforces this idea that we're not as hegemonic as we think we are yes. in some like larger way. And I mean, just a commenting on that, I mean, working on the trials, I had the opportunity, I guess is what you would call it, to see all of the photos um, taken from all the cameras at Abu Ghraib. And it was just a very small um, percent uh, that were of these photos. And of course, all the rest were kind of like these videos that you would see yeah. on YouTube. And in fact, um, what we saw were, you know, uh, I mean, of course, they weren't living in barracks, they were living in prison cells, but you would see, um, so sorry for the images you're about to understand, but like, you know, other soldiers like, bagging each other when they're asleep and doing all of these like sexualized things to each other very uh, against the grain of this hegemonic masculinity soldier type thing and so it, and even uh, replicating some of the feminization and torture stuff that they were doing to prisoners so it was just sort of um, part and parcel of maybe what it meant to be at Abu Ghraib or even in the larger military. But this is fascinating because I think what this means how you take up some of the is that maybe we want to go back to thinking about sort of homosexuality yeah. and how all male spaces actually become, you know, how they sort of produce this kind of yeah. homosexual, homoeroticized behavior. I'm thinking this is like a frat. Yeah, there's been right. analyses. Yeah. Like so, you know. Totally. <laughs> but, but it also seems to me, and I think along these same lines, and, and Nathaniel, in the abstract you sent, you mentioned this, and I didn't hear you say it in your talk, but you talked about what this also means in the context of the of increasing acceptance of gay marriage, yeah. right? And if we put that alongside what's happening with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the new role of female combatants, it, it seems to me that that it's a, a fairly complicated picture that's about, what have you talked about, like the construction of the new normal set against yeah. a context of militarism, neoliberalism, hegemony. Um, yeah, it, it seems like, like we're going to have uh, various normativities at play <laughs> at once. So, um, so whether we're going to have this sort of like assimilationist uh, normativity that says gays are normal like everybody else, or whether you're going to have a sort of like I guess transgressive normativity, uh, this anti-essentialist normativity, I mean anti-assimilationist, um, then there's going to be a tension, and they're going to exist simultaneously. And um, um, it's a big, complicated mess to, <laughs> to map. <laughs> I just want to, I don't know if you all are familiar with Aaron Balkan has a school book called Bring Me Men, I forget the subtitle of it, but it's, it's a series of historical case studies of military masculinity in the 20th century. Um, but he argues for a reconsideration of masculinity in the military because, and he offers a number of different examples of ways in which ostensibly feminine or feminized positions are crucial or essential to mm -hmm. constituting military masculinity and so actually being able to tolerate being raped or tolerate certain kinds of sexual violations <coughs> of, of one's body that would be considered according to sort of more standard feminist analyses of gender as as feminization, or you know, being penetrated, for example, mm -hmm. he says can be understood as masculine and are understood as masculine in the military. And so it's just a really fascinating book. And one of the yeah, yeah. one of the most interesting things he says is that um, actually talking about the the rape of women in the military, while well, the, the military is like super uncomfortable with it, it's much more convenient, and they want to restrict discussion mm -hmm. of rape in the military it's to so women, rape of women because there is a much yeah. bigger, much more scandalous problem with rape of. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah.
and that it, it raises the specter of all kinds of homosexual specters that they actually can't deal with and that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was you know, meant to ward off. And it's it, yeah. really interesting stuff. Who's the best one? Aaron Belkin, B-E-L-K-I-N. I mean, he's actually an interesting person, too, because he did an enormous amount of work to get Don't Ask, Don't Tell repealed. And then he, I think, as far as I can tell, had a big crisis of conscience, but oh, wait, military is like really bad. <laughs> and then I think this book is sort of an act of contrition and like coming to terms with himself of the work that he's done around it. It's very interesting. Yeah, perhaps. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, I was wondering if it would be useful or like if any of you have thought of this in the framework of like luxuries of presentation that like thinking about you were just talking about those videos of like soldiers like basically performing drag and like I was thinking through that in like connection to the the various normativities at play and like how does how does playing out normativities or like the opposite relate to the like luxury of being able to perform that and not fear that your subject position is in danger, I guess. Or like that's what I think of when I think of the drag situation that you're talking about. Yeah. That like these soldiers can perform this because their their assumed heteronormativity yeah. in some ways is like not endangered or like thinking through it in terms of that. I think what's interesting about it, the reason why the, that status is not in danger is because part of the frat thing that you were kind of bringing up is the difference between like in homosocial context, like if you you know anything about the Arab, the Arab world, which is where I do a lot of my work, you know, the, you know, following Butler, not following Butler, identity is not constitutive of social practice. You do not fuck, therefore you are, as in the American, in the American <laughs> landscape, right? Um, and like, I think we have to start thinking about the military in that way, where especially because so much of it is deep, is connected to down low, and connected to a difference between like the sexual act and an identitary, like, you know, it's not a performative. The habit of sex does not make them a homosexual. It's just something that they do, right? And it's something that actually that kind of reinforces a certain kind of masculinity by being non, by like, by in incorporating that femininity to a certain degree. So I think that like, that is one of the things we have to look at and the comfortability, the luxury of it, I guess, is to be able to, you know, engage in the act without feeling subject to the identity, right? Um, which I think is what, as we heard in the liberal kind of queer homo nationalist critique, as we go further, we're gonna hit a wall, I think, right, about this identity versus act thing, right? Because what happens when people who don't identify as gay need rights for the acts that they're doing but don't, don't have a label to go under it to, to get those rights for? And the military is a perfect example of the rapes that we were talking about our perfect example of that, right? So I don't know when, but I know it's gonna happen soon. And I don't, I'm trying to figure out like, what happens once we hit that lit litmus test? Like, once we hit that point, like where, what, what could possibly happen? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, a very stimulating discussions from everyone. Um, my one question I wanted to, was pointing towards Nathaniel. Like, your presentation I found fascinating it's, it, it can be read a couple of ways, or more than a couple of ways, obviously. And it's interesting to me, I kind of feel like it begs the question, do you think with this kind of repositioning of uh, uh, sort of the government's view of religious groups, particularly uh, more extreme right groups, more extreme religious groups in America, could that possibly be seen as progress in some way, in that there's you know sort of this putting religion on, making religion secondary. Um, of course, it's secondary to government. Um, or on the other hand, is, is it you know, the actual triumph of the state over, over everything, including people's cultural uh, ties to their religion and to other things? And obviously, it's problematic because it's being coupled with the way we're, you know, the other end of, of the Muslim enemy and stuff like that. But to see it happening within the country is really a fascinating thing because I'm thinking of, you know, the queer community so long has been battling against uh, the religion, the conservative religious community. Um, obviously, it puts it in a real kind of, it's a puzzle, you yeah. know, to think how, so I'm just wondering how you feel about that, if you have any sort of um, 
recommendations. Yeah, well, I, I, I think this notion of progress is, is very interesting. Uh, interesting, and I'm, I like to think about the sort of like ideological work that it does. Um, I, I think like on a personal level, like I, like I grew up in like a fairly religious environment. Like I went, went to a Lutheran university, and I remember the sort of like things that I had to negotiate when I was like in these more like conservative environs, and the sorts of like frustrations and angers, but also like alienations that I would have like at the time. And now that like I uh, inhabit more queer spaces and more queer friendly spaces, in many ways that is a sort of thing of the past. And and that's a um, and, and that is in many ways a, a kind of progress. Mm. And um, and so with regard to um, the, the nation state, um, I I I think one thing for me is that a lot of these narratives about the religious right and these sorts of characterizations of the religious right is that they are in many ways, or at least appear to be, very uncannily true. Mm -hmm. And it's very compelling for us to like, think of the religious right in these terms. And in many ways, uh, I can think of people who I know who are religiously conservative. And in many ways, they sort of like, like fit these very like perverse profiles. And um, the kinds of um, and so there's an ambivalence between a sort of recognition that um, there is a mode of progress in switching away from this sort of rigidly religious and constrictively religious mode of being um, to something else. And in many ways, this is worth celebrating. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm always holding in tension this uh, progress, and this is a very problematic term, of the progress versus the, um, uh, versus the kind of ideological work that functions when we quarantine extremism. And I, I, I think that this ties back in many ways to like a lot of like, uh, both of yours in particularly, is this sort of, uh, this heterosexual matrix, the logic, mm -hmm. the logics of heterosexism, and how that these are, Pervasive. These are things that we swim in, and when we um, look at bigots, so forth, in many ways, the sort of monster terrorist bag has been replaced by the monster terrorist bigot. In many ways, and um, and so what what they do in many ways is sort of like obfuscate the logics of heterosexism, mm -hmm. and um, by focusing on the hateful people. Um, and the sort of, you were talking about love and how like in many ways queers are viewed as love and the sort of like ideological moves yeah. of positioning us, we're on the side of love, they're on the side of hate. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so what I would want to say is there's this obfuscation going on of the logics and practices and violences of heteronormativity, neoliberalism, and um, American exceptionalism and American imperialism going on in these discourses that position the religious right and Muslims as these puritanical others. Straight women, kind right, of like right. romance, 
these these are like the few kind of places that we haven't seen. These will be the next Will and Grace. <laughs> 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 but what they wind up doing is they wind up like reifying like man, right? Because yeah. what do yes. what do a gay man and a straight man have in common? Oh, yes. They're both men. Yeah. What, what you know yes. in a kind of yeah. you know in a very different way that I think gets to a lot of what you're saying, and I think that. It still actually follows a lot of those normative logics because a lot of those women who want to fight in combat might be fighting because they want to prove mm -hmm. that they are as strong and as you know. And the main reason why women weren't was mostly like logistical, is like how much weight you could carry, right. right? And those those same you know those same are still there. You still have to pass the tests right. in order to do it. So the like the the people who are physically you know there's the and that's where the problematic biological. Mm -hmm. Kind of argument right. starts creeping in right. and making us like question whether or not like this is a good idea, and so you know, the interesting thing will be like what percentage you know the women who will fight on the front lines in order to even pass mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. the qualifications right. will be butch even if they don't sleep with women right. even if they're right. not whatever like right. they'll be they'll be right. butch right. they have to yeah. in order to physically get past all of the tests so I think that it doesn't does does do as much change. We might think it could in that way. Well, in the military, uh, in Sports. basketball, yeah, right? Yeah. Sports, right? Basically in basketball, mm -hmm. in tennis, yeah. right? I mean, and so, and, and well, certainly no, no one would say that Serena Williams are being as slight as their butch. So I, really? I, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's also an interesting racial life. Not to yeah, yeah. Say that yeah, yeah. Matter, yes, right? that's correct. You know, yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much.